Hey everyone, it's Presley at AdultGames.com here, and today we're back at the Nature and Science Museum to ma- to interview Megan Truckee, who is a mammal technician here at the Nature and Science Museum. So, yeah, let's go. So this is our dermisterium, so I'll tell you a little bit about the process because it's really smelly in there. Um, so what we do is, like, if someone brings in something that was hit by a car, and we want its skeleton and its skin, and I'll, I can take you back there because I know you watch the green scoop, so I can take you back there too. We'll take the skin off, and then we'll take some of the tissue off and put it in here. This is our flesh-eating beetle colony. So then they'll clean up all the bones for us. So watch your step. So what we'll do is we'll set the, uh, the carcasses on there. They'll dry, and then we'll stick them right in here. Beetles will eat all the flesh off of the skeleton for us. So you can see they're kind of moving around inside there. Yep, and they'll crawl all over it and clean it for us. So you can see, like, this one went in there and it looked like that before. So they do a pretty good job. Then they'll come in here once they're done. So you can see some of them that are finished. Yeah, and then we'll clean it, and then it's ready to go in the collection. This is actually part of a lion. Beetles, we have spiders, we have marine invertebrates like shells, and butterflies. So here is some of, this is our beetle pinning area. So you can see we have lots of different beetles that are pinned out. In our entomology collection, we have a just over 900,000 of these bugs. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And you can see, like, there's different ways of pinning them, too. So, like, you can stick a pin right through the bug, or you can put it on this little piece of paper. You want and to look through the microscope? Do you want to look through the microscope? Yeah. Okay, just a, let me get a view here of this thing that you can hop up here. Can you see a spider in there? Mm-hmm. That's really cool. What color is it? It's kind of yellowish. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what you see, Poochan. It's, it's it eyes are kind of far apart. Two, like there's four up there, and then there's two. That's a good observation because that tells you the way those eyes are arranged. It tells you that that's a thing called an aranead. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that make the nice orb. You know, the web that is nice and round and has a, things like this. You've probably seen them in your garden or something. So yeah, this is a bird of paradise. So you can see it has these cool tail feathers. So he'll sit up on a branch and just kind of shake them to attract the females. And then this one has a green stomach. And then on the back side, it's got some red and some orange. And then this. It's like a cape, so he'll puff it out when he sees a female come nearby. Yeah. So do you know what this bird is? I don't know what they're called, but I think I see one. Mm-hmm. They're called magpies. Yeah. You can find them around Denver. And so this is a normal one. Then we have this one. And this is a magpie too. Do you know what's going on with this bird? It looks albino. Yep, it's a form of albinism. Mm -hmm. So what happens, and this happens in all kinds of different species of birds, is it's a form of albinism called leukism. Mm -hmm. And what happens is this bird can still produce these dark pigments, Mm -hmm. but it's just being blocked. With albinos, they can no longer produce this dark pigment. So that's how we know it's leukism. These are passenger pigeons. So these used to, there used to be hundreds of millions of these birds flying around America, but they're all extinct now. A lot of times they were, they were shot for sport. They were, um, their habitat was destroyed. They were also shot because you can see on these guys, you can see some of the iridescence right there. They were, for the hat trade, so they would shoot them and then use their feathers and hats. A skull for you. <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy that. Um, 
cool. So that's pretty wild, huh? His mm -hmm. teeth. What do you think, sweetie? That was awesome. Do you have any questions you want to ask about it? Is it bigger than you thought it would be? I, yeah, it's a lot bigger than I thought it would be because I haven't gotten like really up close with the wolf. Mm -hmm. But I've been, but I've seen wolves like wild wolves in Yellowstone through a telescope, not really a telescope. Yeah, like a spying scope. Yeah. Yeah. And I pulled some of my favorite things too. So this. Any ideas as to what this is? It looks, it looks really like, it, I mean, I first thought it was rhino it has tusks, but it looks more like a boar. It's a babirusa, which is a pig from Indonesia. So it's, yeah, it's like a boar. This is probably one of my favorites in the entire museum. Um, I was going through the collection and I found him. We didn't even realize we had this specimen. But do you see anything weird about him? It's a jackalope. Yep, it's a jackalope. So yep, he's got his two ears here and then he's got some horns, some Morty Gross there. And he's got one on his mouth there on his cheek and then on his nose. He's actually got some on his, his stomach and abdomen too. Um, it's caused by a virus. So it's called the Shope papilloma virus. And what happens is when they get that, the growth will start forming and it usually is just to their face. It doesn't really hurt them in any way, but they'll just keep growing those parts. And yeah, it's where the legend of the jackalope comes from. Wow. Really cool thing is this guy. So he's green and yellow, and then you flip him over and his head's purple. He's really cool. It's beautiful. Yeah. And then this one is that really pretty blue? Flip him over and he's red there. Oh. That's really cool. Yeah. This is a bear, a grizzly bear. This is the last grizzly bear from Colorado. Wow. Yeah. She died in 1979. And we acquired her in. 1981. Yeah, there's her her pelt, and then this is more of what I like to do is more of the forensic work behind bones. So we can do things like estimating her age from her bones, and one of the places we'll look is her spine. So you'll see all these extra bony growths that don't look like they should be there. That's called arthritis. So we know she was really old. If you look at her skull, we can also notice things about her lifestyle. Um, so you see that hole right there? And that little thing hanging in there? So that's the root of her tooth. So she probably either got a tooth infection or something happened on the side of her face and she ended up having an infection right there, an abscess. And then you can see that tooth was broken off at some point in time, which might have helped lead to the infection in some form. Um, you can also see, if you look at the side, there's a line along the teeth. We have it too, it's called our enamel line, it's that. Um, and her teeth are worn down so much that it's almost down through the enamel. So based on the arthritis and her teeth, we can estimate her age to be early to mid-twenties, which for a bear in the wild is really old. Most people say it's got a longer beak, it's a male. It's actually the other way around. This is the male and this is the female. And there was a researcher about 120 years ago or so that went to New Zealand and was observing these birds and what he observed was that this bird with the short stout beak would go and peck a hole in a tree and then this one would come behind him and stick its long beak in the hole that the other one made and pull out the grubs and things from inside the tree so it's basically like the boy was taking the girl out on a date yep they're eggs they're eggs from this bird 
called the Epiornis bird, or the elephant bird. They lived on Madagascar. They went extinct about four to 700 years ago. And having complete eggs is very, very rare. There's only about just over 20 full eggs in the world. And we have two of them. So that's really cool. And something really interesting is if you, when people collect eggs, if you come here, you can see there's a hole in it, right there. So they'll drill holes in eggs um, to drain out everything so that the egg doesn't go bad. But with this one, when they drained it out, something solid was still inside. So we're gonna get this one CT scanned and there maybe is a little bird in there. We're not sure. <laughs> and actually, the thing about birds is they're really hard to identify between sexes um, unless there's sexual dimorphism, which just means that the male or the female is different colored than the, than the other one. With snowy owls, though, we can tell them apart because, say like this one, see how he's really white? The males are really white in the snowy owls, whereas the females have this these patches of brown, which is called barring. So that's a good way to be able to tell, differentiate between the males and the females of the snowy owls. So actually, Hedwig in the book is a male owl, right? But in the movie, they had to use, they had to use, no wait, Hedwig's a female in the book, but they had to use a male owl because it was all white. So, there's some trivia for you. We're gonna get a bigger one in the new facility. But you can see we have people who are making study skins and they're doing skinning process. This is the one I was working on this morning. Haven't gotten a chance to finish it yet. Here's the skin. So, one thing about our collection You'll see that I've only kept one pair of feet with the, with the skin. So the reason that is is because it optimizes research potential. So if someone wants to come in and look at the skin, they have the feet that they can look at on the skin. And if someone wants to look at the, the toe bones and the feet bones in the skeleton, they have one side with the skeleton. Cool. Go to school tomorrow about what you do? I did. I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin Madison in anthropology and zoology. And then I went on to grad school at George Washington University where I got my master's in anthropology and museum training. And then while I was there doing school, I worked at the Smithsonian for two years. Have you always wanted to work in a museum? No, actually. I originally wanted to be a doctor. I went and started school and got to chemistry and said, nope, <laughs> I did not like chemistry, but I liked bones and I liked tissues and those types of things. So um, I decided to switch over to the anthropology side of it, doing that. And yeah, and my training is actually as a zooarchaeologist. Do you know what that is? <laughs> I didn't know about it either. <laughs> So a zooarchaeologist is someone who works on an archaeological team. So I've worked in Turkey. I went on to an archaeological dig in Turkey. And when they're digging up on an archaeological dig, you know, they'll find buildings, they'll find pots, they'll find humans, and they'll also find animals, things that they ate or had as pets. And so what I do is I'll take all those bones, even the human bones, and we analyze them and try and figure out what was going on at that site. You know, maybe they were in the process of domesticating pigs, or maybe there's just a huge cache of like squirrels and other little rodents that maybe they ate. So that's what I did. So I looked at that stuff. So. What's your favorite specimen or exhibit? My jackalope is the favorite, my favorite specimen. Do you name the specimens? I don't. There are far too many for me to name. Um, yeah, even my favorite one I haven't named. Some of them have names. Like, 
we get some specimens from the zoo or some of the rehab facilities that name them. We keep their names with them if they've already been named, but we don't generally, generally call them by their names. How does the museum get the animals? Great question. The museum gets the animals as either roadkill, um, things that are found dead. They will look at, um, well, we have relationships with rehabilitation centers, so if someone brings in a sick or wounded animal to a rehab center and they, it won't make it, and they kill it, then they will donate it to us as well. Um, our curator does still go out and actively collect, not like they did in the old days where they just went and shot everything. He has very specific goals when he goes out and collects, so a lot of his research focuses on chipmunks. So he'll go and he understands chipmunks and where they go, where they live, their habitats. So what he'll do is he'll go to those specific spots and he'll catch, you know, he'll catch very specific things. He won't catch everything, but he'll, he still goes out and collects every once in a while. Do kids ask, is everything dead like Emily has? <laughs> yep. <laughs> every, yep. Kids always ask that. They also ask, was this alive? Is this alive? Um, is this real? What is the coolest thing you've seen or worked on? Oh, man. Coolest thing I've worked on. I've worked on, helped with that lion. Um, I've worked on a Jerinook. You know what a Jerinook is? It's a small antelope from Africa. I've worked on Jerboas, which it's a small rodent with a really long tail from um, like Mongolia area. I've worked on those. I've done a wolf. Um, what else cool have I done? There's a bunch of things. Do you have advice for someone who wants to do what you do? Yes. Volunteer and intern as much as possible. Definitely get a master's, if not even a PhD. Um, so lots of schooling. And then as you're doing schooling, intern as much as possible. So I told you that I worked at the Smithsonian. I worked um, on my undergraduate campus, Zoological Museum, that's where I started. Um, I've worked at the British Museum. I worked on the archeological dig in Turkey. So I mean, I've worked quite a few places and I'm still pretty young. So definitely get as much experience as you can in it. Do you ever change the dioramas? No, they actually haven't been changed since the late 50s. They've been the same things. I want to change them because I think it'd be cool to change them. But I also understand that they're, they're historical artifacts in and of themselves just because they've been in the museum for so long. So they have that really cool historical aspect to them. And do you know that the backgrounds themselves are like very specific locations, right? Yeah. We actually, um, when Kirk Johnson was still here, he was our vice president, he said he had a visitor come in and look at one of the dioramas. And they were like, oh, I've been there. and like. We didn't actually know what that location was. We had lost it through documentation. So we were able to figure out what that location was again, which is really cool. What's one thing about the museum that people don't know but they should? Mm. That only about two to three percent of what's on exhibit is what we have in the museum. So 97 percent the public doesn't even see and doesn't even know is here. How did you get into acting? <laughs> How'd you hear about that? <laughs> uh, how did I get into acting? Really, where did you hear about that from? We, were, um, we just looked up Megan. Oh, you Googled me and I came up. Yeah. So when I moved out here to Denver, I didn't know anybody. I just kind of picked up my stuff from DC and moved out here for the job. and. I finally had free time because I wasn't going to school, so I thought, heck, why don't I try something I've never tried before, and that was acting. I really enjoy movies, so. And plus, I'm normally really shy and introverted, and I thought that that might actually help me 
like communicating with the public and that type of thing. So yeah, that's how I got involved with it. Are there things like in the museum that are out on display that people don't really know about or are there like exhibits that people don't really pay attention to that you think should get more attention? Hmm. I'm, I think people should take more time when they're looking at the dioramas because there's so much information on, on the little placards and just looking at it. So I think if I could tell the public one thing, it would be, you know, take your time when you're walking through here. Enjoy it. You know, really look at it because all of that is very meticulously planned. If there was... Um, anything in here that could go into one that you think should go into one of the exhibits that are already here or that's getting worked on, what would you put and where would you put it? I would, and this is actually I think being considered the the bear, the last grizzly bear, because that seems to be a favorite for everybody, and it's part of Colorado's history. So I think having that available to the public is a very vital thing and I think it's being considered actually her skull was on display for a while um, and then it was taken off but putting her skull back on exhibit and that would be up by the bear diorama. So thank you for spending a little bit of time with us so we can ask some questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anytime you want to come back just let me know okay.